Hello, and welcome to Lost in Criterion, the show where I, the Adam Glass, and my great friend, Patrick Dorgan, out there in Japan, talk about the Criterion Collection films. This hello. week's movie... Oh, hello, Pat. <laughs> this week's movie is Federico Fellini's Amarcord, made in 1973, set uh, autobiographical a little bit, at least to the experiences of him and his friends from I read, set in 1930s Italy, that's Italy under the fascist... Wasn't that the a great time for everyone? Fantastically fascist rule. The fantastic fascist rule. Apparently, based on this film. No, well, based on this film. Yeah, uh, that's one thing. The the uh, title, Armor Court, um, translates to I Remember, supposedly. Uh, Fellini actually claims that it is a uh, neologism, uh, a word he just made up. Uh, yes, I just defined that for you. Um, yeah, just in he, case you're not he, aware. He says it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't mean anything, but it is very close to some dialects that means I remember, uh, which is what my subtitles in the movie translated it to. Because, Mine too. Yeah, I think most do. So despite what Fellini wants you to believe, everyone else thinks it means I remember. And right, since, anybody who's not Italian. Since uh, literary critics define how we read books and movie critics define how we watch movies, they get to be right. Over Not the director or the writer. I live on the edge. There you go. All right. Well, you don't have to believe that it means I remember. Even <laughs> though taking it as memories of a childhood uh, explains the sort of cartoonish caricatures of the uh, of the movie quite well, I think. Yeah. But we'll, we'll um, get into that yeah. once we start the... Well, how did you feel about the movie? Thank you. I'm glad that we decided <laughs> to add this little particular element. Um, I thought that the film overall, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was a little bit trippy, but I enjoyed it. All right. How all did right. you feel, Adam? Well, I, it, how was it? <laughs> it was no Hudson Hawk, but uh, <laughs> but I still like it. The greatest it. movie of all time. Oh yes, certainly. It's a little similar to Hudson Hawk. They're both very cartoony. Uh, no characters are really real. They're all just flat caricatures of things. Oh, um, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, well, obviously, get into this a little, a little more. Hudson Hawk has more of a plot, as ridiculous as the plot is. This is... <laughs> it is it is plot-driven. Yeah. I, I, we need to stop comparing things to Hudson Hawk, but... No, or we, we need do this to, for every, every movie. Episode. Every movie. All right. This is a new... A new addition to Lost in Criterion, where we compare every movie to the Bruce Willis 1994, two? I, I don't remember. Early 90s vehicle, Hudson Hawk, uh, which is a ridiculous movie and one of the worst things on rated on Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic. But it's one of the Pat greatest films of all love. time. It, well, it's, it's a taste thing. You, <laughs> you either love it or you hate it. No, no accounting for us. I think right. that's, uh, knowing that we like Hudson Hawk, though, might completely ruin our credibility. Yeah, or it makes us really, really, like, hip. We have no credibility. It's fine. Yeah. Why <laughs> are you right. listening to this? All righty. Anyway, uh, the movie overall takes place over one year. I was surprised to learn that a lot of this is shot in studio. Um, really? Massive studios, uh, mind you, but not on any sort of location thing. Everything, their sets, uh, including the, the ocean liner scene is all on a set. What? No. Yeah. Really? Yes. Yes. That's Completely very ridiculous. Um, yeah. Really, Why really Why would surprised. they do that? Is it uh, easier to get an ocean than a giant set filled with water and boats? I don't know. Fellini, Fellini, I think it was some sort of control thing. Um, <laughs> he hates the outdoors. In fact, I saw... He's well, agoraphobic. I, I saw an interview, um, one of my well, bonus things, was an interview with the actress who played Gradiska. um... And she was talking about that scene specifically. And I guess the... I mean, it was like a... a I'll call it a model, but it was obviously large scale. The Rex, the boat. Um, I just assumed that they made a giant boat. <laughs> they might have just built a giant boat. Uh, well, it was, it was still pretty big. Uh, and one thing, they were shooting at night. They're in this pool. And uh, 
the wind picked up actually, so they had to they had to wait and wait and wait because the steam coming out of the uh, the smokestacks was blowing in the wrong direction because of the wind. Uh, but they finally, after all that waiting, they go to start, and you know he's he's about to call action, and he just yells, "Stop! Stop!" And he calls a gaffer over. One of the lights on the boat, on the back side of the boat. You mean the side nobody could see? The side no one could see, except maybe from his angle. But certainly the side that you could not see from the perspective of the camera, according to the actress. Um, one of the lights was out. One of one of the lights. Well, and he made him replace it. But it's dark. It. Yes. Uh, whatever. Because nobody on this boat sleeps. Yes. Exactly. Ever. It's, nice. it's, ocean it's light. It's at a distance. Why should every light be on anyway? But he wanted it. He wanted it right. Uh, so, well. so Bellini so apparently, from from what freak. I can gather from that, bit of a control freak, uh, which is fine. That's one thing that makes a great director, or one thing that yeah. can make a great director. Um, obviously, <laughs> every great director kind of has a different thing that makes them a great director. But yeah, but I think general. Yeah. Desire for complete control, pretty, thing. pretty exact in control is is certainly up there as as something good. I guess unless you're making um, a documentary, yeah. Well, then you're not really necessarily directing things more cinematography in your directing than. Yeah, I guess that's true. It's where to point the camera, less what what's happening on it. Yeah, or control over what's happening on. It. Now we've just disparaged all just documentaries, and I really didn't mean to do that. Um, well, we disparage the notion that those guys are directors. Yes, I and that's, that's not true. Statement. I I apologize for making that statement. Please, if you're a documentarian, don't write me letters. Um, <laughs> no way he's gonna write us letters. There's <laughs> no directors might. listening to this. Well, no that's... real directors. <laughs> oh, just documentarians. Right, right, right. <laughs> so much hate mail. <laughs> All right, die, so... Adam, die. <laughs> so essentially, this movie is kind of like our town. Um, in that it's a bunch of little but, vignettes. But not the place that me and Adam are from, the movie Our Town. No, no, but yes, the play, movie, Our Town. Um, I can't remember who wrote that. Uh, uh, anyway. I don't think I've ever seen it, so. I should, I should I'm, really un- I'm an uncultured boob. Yes. Um, <laughs> we'll get into boobs later, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this film, yes, you will. Yes. Um, it won't be pretty, that's for sure. So it's it's basically it's a bunch of vignettes. It takes place over one year. Um, everyone's kind of a caricature, like I already said, uh, but you know they're all they're all the same characters in different scenes. There's no real overarching plot other than time passing. It starts as winter ends. It ends as winter ends. And how did you feel year. about the lack of plot, Adam? How did that how did that make you feel? Uh, it was it was interesting. In that, I, it's not it's not how uh, movies. Ugh. I'm not used to watching movies like that. I suppose me um, neither. It was very. It wasn't even necessarily episodic. It was just a bunch of disconnected things. Right, and it's it struck me as weird because it felt like this ought to be like something like a weird sort of character study, but it would be a character study of characters that aren't characters. Yeah. They're, so yeah, it's they're kind not, of confusing. It was like, they're not well, real people, so it's not, and not even, not even in a, it, it people acting sense. I mean, obviously they're fictional, but they're not real people in that. Well, they're yeah, they're not three dimensional. They're, yeah, they're they're very two dimensional. Yeah, they're very like, two dimensional. He's things. the guy who makes up weird stories and has no yes. teeth. I actually, I yeah, yeah exactly. I actually like that guy, but I like I like that. That was too, my except, favorite character. There, there is a great little thing they do with that though. Um, in that every so often, almost as if this is a documentary, uh, someone will turn to the camera and kind of explain what's going on. That is but such in this a weird com- thing. Completely disconnected way from what what the movie seems to be trying to do at that point. Like we've right. got that we've got that old guy. Uh, they call him Mister Lawyer. Uh, who just talks about like the That's history of the art in architecture. Every time he's on screen, he he's has talking no other to the camera. Meaning. Yeah, and then we've got the guy at the beginning establishing the bonfire. Uh, we've got that toothless man talking about his night with the harem. Um, I love that guy. And, That's my favorite guy. All, oh, he's great. They're all talking directly to the camera as if they're the na- narrators of the film, but they're all narrating vastly different films 
even really different from what we're even watching, except well. And the thing is, is there is no narrator of the film otherwise. Yeah. It's not like yeah. even shifting narrator. There's no exactly. narrative because, because there's, no there's no story. No, there's no narrative to the whole thing. Yeah. So they're just so, narrating this one little, like, not even vignette. It's yeah. like, here is, like, a quick tableau of what yeah. is happening at this point in this person's memory. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I remember when that happened. It's really kind of, I, you know what I imagine? I imagine that this is a film of old men sitting on a porch telling stories to each other. No, that really makes short absolute sense. stories of something that happened in their youth that are not necessarily connected to each other. Yeah, directly. and the details aren't exactly necessarily true right. completely. And, you know, you remember you remember the big characters, the big things, and you fill in right. the stuff that needs to be there. It's a very it's a very I walked uphill both ways and right. in the winter in the, snow, in the winter had gone. to wrap barbed wire around my feet for traction. So, right. so. Yeah, no and, and it I really feel like that's the whole film. It's like yes. here is a series of very brief stories that maybe each story doesn't even have a plot but it's like uh, yes. check out this thing that happened yes 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 and because it's italian everything involves sex yes it does it is amazing <laughs> yes and not in the good way that the me- not, not the, the positive meaning of the word amazing that was <laughs> this is was... the least sex for a film that is basically about a young man's coming yeah, into it's... his own sexually speaking yes it is disgusting Disgusting. There is yes. nothing appealing about it. And, and somehow there's not a single attractive woman in this entire film. <laughs> well, uh, the uh, Foxy, Vol- Volupina. Um, yeah, like, if she didn't have the crazy makeup on, would actually not be she, that bad. She just had the she just had the crazy makeup because she's supposed to be so so deep. She's I mean she's the town nympho or whatever, so she's yeah, so deeply, right, right, deeply right. in lust with everything. I need to point out something, Adam, before what? we go on with this. Is it just me? Maybe it's Italy. But our town <laughs> didn't have these characters in them. No town I've ever heard of had the that town is, is, Maybe, Maybe we were just sheltered. I uh, don't... Yeah, possibly. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible our mothers kept us from knowing about all these things. From the town nympho or the giant boob tobacconist? <laughs> yes. Yes, the giant. Or the lawyer who constantly talks about history as he wanders the streets with his bicycle. <laughs> yes. How do we miss um, all these people? Well, generally, I avoid those people, but uh, I might actually end up being the weird guy who talks about the history as he walks around with his That's bicycle. true. So. That's probably as you, Adam. Um, and I'm probably the big boob tobacconist. Well, clearly. Um, all right, so we start. Um, we start out the movie as winter dies. Um, when the puffballs come, the winter is almost done. When the puffballs soar, the winter is no more. Everybody's got these little little rhymes about it. Because they're all lunatics. <laughs> because they're all lunatics. <laughs> we make up rhymes about puffballs. Which I don't Jake, think is we, a real thing. I really I really like the that scene because we sort of we introduce everybody as we follow the puffballs swirling through town. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know it's sweeping, swirling, drifting. I think the the, the one, the first guy, the first our first kind of narrator, uh, says that a lot. He just repeats drifting, 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 swirling, 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 and that's really. I mean, that's what we're doing, and that's what we're doing. He had dementia. <laughs> he does, but so does Fellini, um, as far as <laughs> yeah, as far as this film is concerned, because that's what we're doing. We're drifting and we're swirling through memories, and it's it's evocative. Um, uh, so we're we're setting up for the bonfire that evening, and uh, talk to the barber about his music. And I really like I really like this scene. And this is why I mentioned this, uh, um, because the one guy asks if the barber's written anything, and he just starts. He says he's he's written something new, and he starts playing it, and it just so seamlessly joins the background music. Yeah, and pulls that in. Um, it's really it's, it's neatly done. I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of neat elements yeah. hidden in this film. Yeah, and it's it's certainly a it's a visually stunning film too. Just with oh, yeah. all the the colors, really. I mean, everything pops, and it's it's a very. I mean, it's everything's infantile in a way, and that Wait, that really all. Did you read together. The, the Wikipedia article about this and how I guess I'm not... the entire intention was to paint fascist Italy as infantile? 
as basically I, I, forcing. I could see that. Yeah, like I mean, I think like we see it now as very a disjointed nightmare world, right? Yeah. But I think his goal was to say, look, I grew up in fascist Italy, and basically the fascist regime regime forced us into a state of uh, infant. Uh, I don't even yeah. know how to conjugate this. Word. Whatever. We were all we were all infants then, like obsessed yeah. with sex and power and yeah, a world that didn't exist. That's, that's a very that's a very uh, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's certainly an interesting commentary on fascism as far as that goes because yeah, I just, um, we got into this last week with uh, with uh, uh, the Hitchcock film, uh, The Lady Vanishes, a little bit thing, right, too. Um, and certainly we got into it with. Uh, the very first movie we watched. Um, Whatever that was. <laughs> anyway, um, The Grand Illusion. Yes. We, we get this disconnect uh, in war because, you know, especially in America, we're kind of taught that all of our enemies were really evil people and all of their motivations were to be evil. Uh, the fascists, the Germans, even the Germans in World War One, and in World War One, you know, that's, you know, they weren't Nazis, all right? <laughs> right. Um... So, you know, the Nazis, the fascists, the, you know, the communists in, in Russia, we get, we get this treatment like they're all just bad, based bad. And, uh, Fellini's treatment of the, of the, uh, fascists here in, you know, it's, a, it's a really delightful thing because they're just, they show up and, you know, Duce is just like surrounded in this fog. You can't even see him for the first little bit. <laughs> and then when he leaves the fog, they're just running through the city. Running, running, running. Yeah, and, like, you get this just very, like, like, I want to call it almost, like, Mel Brooksian picture of fascism. Yes, it's just, like, yes. here was this absurd thing that, for some reason, we thought was a great idea. Exactly. We, we all bought into this illusion, this this dream that was crazy, didn't make sense. This is, this is a view of uh, fascism... In the same way as like duck soup views, <laughs> views fascism. It's just you know these people they're just crazy. Yeah, and and, and I it's, think it's, it's a fair way to paint it. It seems. I mean, like he was there. I mean, he walked out of it, and I think <coughs> because of it, based on like the like the sales of this film and how popular it was, obviously everybody who lived through it was able to say, oh, <coughs> yeah. yeah Kinda how it was. Yeah, it was pretty insane. I will say yeah. this though, fascist Italy seems like a pretty rocking place to be. <laughs> like that parade well, uh, was badass. I think I, I want to be a part of just, that parade. No matter what the political construct in Italy, I think it's generally a rocking place on its <laughs> yeah. on its individual city level. <laughs> well, like, <laughs> especially just with a like not to go way off track, but when the guy was sitting there talking about the size of Mussolini's balls. That was just yes. that was beautiful. <laughs> oh. They have to be huge. I'm like, ah, oh, this is beautiful. Yes, everybody. I am sure and, uh, that conversation took place. I mean, not maybe kinda, at that moment, but I'm sure that yeah. conversation occurred at some point. We kind of still get that in Italy today. There's always the stories. There's the stories about their prime minister now and his his sex parties and yeah, and all that. Or president. I don't know what their political structure is anymore. <laughs> But there's all, well, probably I mean, supreme this, dictator still. I'm not, I'm this not sure. This tie, this well, he does own the majority of their uh, media, actually, which is always fun to learn. Yeah, it's a great way to get elected. Yeah, um, but uh, there's just there's this constant tie in Italian politics, in politics in general, but in Italian politics even today, and and clearly, one thing he's trying to point. You know, it was like that too. This tie of sex and uh, sex and power. Yeah, um, yeah. As it's been said, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. Uh, but not Magni. I didn't say that. Huh? No, another. You didn't say that. <laughs> but yeah, no. Everything's a party here, and that's part of the infantilism. Part of the yeah. The I think that's caricature. what he's trying to oh, point out is like this was yeah. not a party. There was a war going on. Or yeah. about to be a war. And exactly. they're treating it like it's a big party. <laughs> what were yeah. we doing? That was madness. Yeah. Yes. It is. And, you know, and the whole party atmosphere of the whole film is, is established throughout. I mean, we open on a party. We open, oh, yeah. 
we open on that bonfire where they're burning the witch in effigy and almost burn our first narrator guy. <laughs> right, that was so <laughs> cruel. So, yeah. Man. But but no, there's there's one there's one you know one more little subtle establishment. Um, uh, there's a couple characters walking through the city. And I can't remember who they are, uh, but somebody pops up and, and does something to the female of the couple, and she says to her husband, "Your brother is really an asshole." Um, and we just learned that this guy is sixty years old, and and she said, "Your brother is really an asshole," and uh, and the husband's response is, "He's just a kid." Um, oh yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Everyone in the city is just a kid. <laughs> some, well, yeah, some yeah. Tenacious that's always and like the thing. It's like, oh, they're just immature. It's like, what? Who is it yeah. in this town? And that's, and that's another thing. The whole school, all the school scenes, all of our young men are clearly not teenagers anymore. Oh gosh, no. And they're all wearing like short pants, so they're all dressed like they're elementary school students, but they're all clearly in like their twenties and supposed to be middle school, high school students. You yeah, there's like some major like casting disconnect Dawson's there. Dawson's casting and, there. Oh, but <laughs> way worse because there's not even an attempt to like make it seem reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Except for like there was this one. I think they had hired yes. to hire one child. There's one child in all and, of the and school And it's scenes. his brother. It's like the main character's brother. Yeah. He's exactly. the only actual child in the to, school. Yeah. And he's hanging out oh, with yeah. like a bunch of 30-year-olds. <laughs> pretending to be elementary school students or something. <laughs> and you know, it's so... It's ridiculous. And yeah. I mean, it's just the whole thing's ridiculous. And you I know, guess that's the idea. And really, you know. You remember yourself better than you were. Bigger, stronger than you were. So... Yeah, why, you know, not why not be thirty years old in your memory? Why not? Of why not be? Uh, why not be a six foot tall, muscular? Uh, Except for that poor fat kid. Except for the poor fat kid. I guess he remembers himself as a gigantic fat kid. Yes. <laughs> I guess that's the the narrate. Who? I guess the main character's memory. I suppose. Maybe. Maybe it's everybody's memories. They're all sitting it's on the weird, porch in their yeah. home, um, reminiscing about the different things. Um, <laughs> So, okay, so let's see here. So we've kind of discussed sort of the plot, or lack thereof, and some of the characters. Yeah. So let's see here. Uh, what else should we talk about? Well, yeah, there's a, that's one thing with the lack of plot in this movie. There's kind of a lack of substance. Yeah. Um, so we we kind of move from, from party to party, from over overactive. And we, we close on a wedding. And, Which I actually you know, really enjoyed. That was one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, it was nice. And it was a, it was a nice end moment for... Uh, for that character, the woman, uh, Kradiska. So, um, <laughs> yeah. She, she got the prince that she was longing after before. But the um, question is, is that's... Yeah, like, they there was almost a sort of, like, sarcasm to it, though. They're like, oh, you found yeah. your character. And the guy was not very good looking. No, he wasn't. And so it's kind and, of like, and, almost like, are they jabbing fun at her for marrying this powerful man who is also... Yeah. Yeah. Mediocre and at the, same, and old. at the same time, her response to that is to say, long live Italy, and yeah. kind of raise a glass. And it's it's just this deeply, I mean, sure, she might be serious, but at the same time, just this deeply sarcastic thing, given where we are and given what we know happens to fascist Italy. Um, yeah, it's almost kind of like, a, it almost has this sort of like, close your eyes, and, to close it, your eyes and think of the queen think sort of, of yeah, feel to it. It's like, yeah. Long live Italy. Yes. Well, okay. Yes. But it's spring, so there needs to be a wedding. Yeah. And the fat kids certainly aren't getting married. <laughs> <laughs> Not the way he dreamed of it. As, with, as, uh, as much as he wants to. With Mussolini. <laughs> it's such a great scene. That oh, was, bouncing back and forth. Things. We're back to back and forth as much as the movie does. Um, it's fine. But, I feel but like the scene... any discussion of this film is going to be like yeah. eclectic at best. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we're discussing individual scenes because that's how the movie exists. Uh, his dream of the wedding with the huge paper mache that is so beautiful. Uh, Mussolini head, pronouncing them married. It's such a beautifully ridiculous scene, and it 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 ties another thing into it that the priest gets into, and everybody kind of is. There's very much a tie between the Catholic Church and and the fascist regime here, um, and. You know, we we first meet the priest in the school praising the church and praising the state, but talking. I mean, he's talking about the one who came and 
And, you know, the implication from the church end of things would be that he's talking about Christ, but at the same time, there's this very, he's talking, kind of like talking like Mussolini as savior. Yeah, too. yeah. <clears throat> and and the further we go with that, uh, we we certainly get a deification of Mussolini in the fascism scene, in the parade scene, with his huge head <clears throat> addressing the crowd. <clears throat> well, and I Excuse found me. out, like, um, I did, like, totally unrelated stuff, but I was, uh, like, on the internet, and I guess that was the sort of official thing for him. Like, I, it's, I don't know how to describe it, like, that disembodied floating Wizard of Oz, Oz-esque head was kind of, like, a major official representation of him a, as no the leader idea. of the state, like, without a neck or shoulders or facial, like, the rest of his face, his ears. Well, to be, to be fair, the rest of Mussolini's body wasn't really something to look at. No, I know, but it's like, yeah, like, I mean, well, I mean, you compare it to other fascist regimes, you have, like, uh, you know, Hitler was represented as Hitler, like, the whole yes. man, but, yes, like, Mussolini was more represented as, like, like I said, like, it's sort of face. like the Wizard of Oz <laughs> floated in, like a, like, a green mist. It's like, like, that face was him to them, which is weird. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's weird. I like the I like the Wizard of Oz comparison. Well it looks so, a lot like him, frankly. It does. It I'm does. wondering if there was some maybe some prop sharing involved. <laughs> maybe. Maybe they just used the head. Yeah, they're just like, Can we Wizard borrow that? It's great. Um, as we've said, everyone in this movie obsessed with sex. Um, mm. and it's it's hard to it's hard to talk about the movie without talking about Which brings about that. me to my least favorite scene, I, which I would like to mention right off the bat. Okay. The car which masturbation is? scene. That was the weirdest yes. and most uncomfortable moment in this film. For me. <laughs> okay, so they're all at confession, and uh, Tita, uh, who, you know, with our whole success, <laughs> or so, obsession with sex, our main character, young man's name is Tita. Um, I, he, uh, he doesn't want to confess anything, and, and he, he finally admits to touching himself once. And the priest says, St. Anthony, I think, cries whenever you, uh, whenever you touch yourself or something like that. Um, and then we come to the next guy, and the priest asks if he's ever touched himself. And the priest, the priest, by the way, completely uninterested in these confessions. Oh, yeah, like these confessions um, are not relevant at all to him. Like he, keeps, he keeps breaking it, uh, interrupting them in order to tell somebody where to put flowers. Right, he's he's all he's distracted by the aesthetics of the church, um, more than what his actual job should be within the church. Um, so you know, it's it's not necessarily. I don't think it's supposed to be an attack on religion in general, uh, or a critique of religion in general, but certainly a critique of the Catholic Church at the time. Well, and I think probably in, in Italy, if this is as we talked about before. It's supposed to be semi-autobiographical, probably specifically yeah. an attack on a specific priest who is the head. Yeah, it could be that. <laughs> very, very well is that as well. Um, so he's he's obsessed with the look of the church, which is, you know, at the same time, his power uh, is is how great the cathedral work looks, um, much more than than whatever he's he might be preaching, and certainly much more than his taking confessions. Anyway, uh, so the kid after Tita walks up. Um, and the first question the priest asks is, uh, without even looking at him, uh, have you ever touched yourself? And the kid says, just once in the garage. And we get this cutaway scene, uh, <laughs> of, 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 of four of them, four of them, in, in, four of the kids, four of the guys, uh, sitting in a car, masturbating. Yeah, it was so uh, Hitting the weird. horn and hitting, hitting the headlights. Uh, they're just once. And they're moaning different people's names. Oh, it's so ridiculous. It's over the top. It is, I mean, and I understand that it's top. supposed to portray the entire thing as, like, over the top. Like, the question by the priest, like, has this teenage boy ever touched himself? Well, come on. Yes. And then, like, him saying only once in the garage. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I guess that might it technically is... be true. Yeah. Oh, no, it's it's ridiculous. And it's and we get that, and that's... But oh, that scene we get, was so weird. I, I, yeah. I was like, it it is funny, but like it's more funny to talk about than it was actually to see. Yeah. To actually see and it was we upsetting. Get, we get in that same in that same sequence. We get Tita talking about going into the movies with Radiska, and slowly 
mostly <laughs> changing seats every five seconds. Yeah, there's nothing to, subtle to get about closer, this. Closer, yeah, nothing subtle about how he. But he's a teenage boy. He's not supposed to be subtle. Uh, he doesn't know how yet. Um, and he moves in and 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 moves in and, moves in, uh, and eventually is sitting right beside her and then puts her his hand on her knee and she doesn't react and then slides his hand up her leg and she doesn't react and finally he gets far enough up her uh, up her thigh and she just turns and says, are you looking for something? Yeah, I know. Well, and that in her reaction is so kind of like, at this point, like by this point in the movie, almost stereotypical for the movie, like that she wouldn't react <laughs> in a normal human way. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, just that that to me that almost a epi- like epitomized that and the the large breasted back in this scene basically epitomize yes. the sort of treatment of sexuality in this film. Yes. And, it's also and of being course, the style. whole of Pina everywhere. Um, it's very Yeah, I guess that's true. Like her <laughs> One more thing. And, you know, I just I just was reminded of this, and and again, this is a very disjointed conversation, but the movie's disjointed, so I'll go with it. Um, one more thing on the infantilism of uh, the fascists. We're talking about this way, way quickly, too, so I want to throw as many breaks into it, I guess, as I can. Well, it's fine. If we finish um, early, we finish early. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, um... Uh, Tita's father gets... A, his, his mother won't let him go to the rally because she knows he's he's a dissident. Um, in, in what manner anyone in the city is a dissident, I can't believe. <laughs> but he's a dissident, so she locked the gate and won't let him go to the rally for the for the fascists. Um, but someone that night ends up playing a, the opposition's anthem uh, from a uh, record player in the top of the bell tower. Um <laughs> and all of the fascist guards, like 20 people, just shooting yeah, at this just record player on for five thing. minutes straight, completely unloading on it before anyone hits it. <laughs> yeah, well, and this gets into this, like, kind of, I saw this in some of the, like, commentaries on this that I read about connecting that same infantilism with, like, sex and everything else with an infantilism towards the use of firearms. They just go crazy. Yeah, they don't... The use of- they're not, there's no purpose or aim to their action. Somebody could just climb the bell tower yeah. and bring it down. Yeah. But they want to, like, somehow there's, assert there's themselves. There's clearly no aim to their actions. Yeah, like, well, yeah, because yeah, they also can't hit themselves. the damn thing. But, I mean... They're firing their guns. Yeah, because it's it's not about, for them, the, the most expedient means yeah. of removing a gramophone. It's about it's, it's the, uh, showing their power. It's the, it's the manliest way to remove a gramophone. <laughs> right. But the thing is, is it, and it, even it becomes a joke in and of itself, because... It is the manliest way to remove a gramophone if you hit it within, like, five shots. But when yes, you unload for exactly. five minutes and none of you hit it, it's not manly anymore. Yeah. It's just sad. I guess that's and supposed it's, to be it's, part of the commentary that involved there. Yeah, And it's weird because in the very next scene we get reminded that the, the violence isn't the manliness of it. It's just the firing of the weapon, I think. Right, right. Because in the next scene we get Tita's father arrested and his punishment... You know, as he comes in, we have some guy sent home, and the and the head of the of the interrogation <coughs> says something like, "See, don't yeah, don't like, say the fascists are, are all terrible people." Yeah, yeah. Because he like, just gets to Johnson, go. Johnson, watch your tongue. Catch you later, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, so, so Tita's dad is interrogated, um, and uh, it's all kind of a confusing conversation that they're having. And then they just make him drink castor oil. Well, yeah, in the, well, in the conversation, just, just to talk about the conversation for a second, it's so like what you see in a movie that's making fun of police interrogations. Yes, like it's no, like exactly. it's like where were you on the night of the fifth? <coughs> I was at home. Yes. Uh, it's like I, I can't do an interpretation Why of it, but it's just absurd. It's like I, how uh, his father could even figure out what they were talking about based on their questions <laughs> is impossible. <laughs> Exactly. Like, even yeah. if he knew, yeah. he wouldn't know. Because it's so confusing what they're saying. It's like, like you yeah. know about I the mean, gramophone, don't you? It's like, no, no? what? What gramophone? I just, don't I lie to me. And then they pour castor oil down his throat. It's like, and then they pour castor oil down his throat. Which is such, you know, a classic punishment for a child. Right, right. It's like, why didn't you, you know, wash his mouth is, out with soap? Yeah, why? Uh, why not? You know, there's a lot of. They make him stand in the corner. They don't. They don't. They don't beat him. They don't throw him in jail. 
They don't, you know, just shoot them outright. These are not evil, violent people. They're this is power children obsessed. punishing children. Yeah, the children power, power <laughs> mad children punishing other children. Yeah, they're just... Yeah. And I guess that's part and of the whole just, thing, is that it's supposed to be portrayed that way, right? Like, none of these people yeah. are adults. Yeah, exactly. They, they suspect this guy is involved in a thing that at most is an illicit playing of a song yes. that didn't seem to affect anybody other than the people yeah. annoyed. And then their punishment yeah. is equally absurd. Yeah, exactly. And they're just punishing everybody. That they, you know what I mean? Like, there's not even like a an attempt to identify who did it. Assuming it is a crime because it's fascist Italy, right? They're not actually yeah. trying to find out who did it to punish them thoroughly. They're just generally casting a wide net of punishment over anybody they suspect yes. might be involved. Pull, pull in the usual suspects, and then instead of trying to figure anything out from there, just make them all drink. Casserole right, and then go to and send and, them home. Yeah, get sent to the bed without send them dinner. to bed early without dessert. Right, exactly. Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> my favorite scene as far as the whole sex obsession in this movie goes, though, um, the to- certainly the tobacco scene is ridiculous, it is absurd, um, yeah. and, and, and absurd and creepy. But uh, Uncle Tio, Crazy Tio, up oh the yeah, tree. shouting, I um, want a woman. They go, they go, and they get him out of the. Uh, out of the asylum for the afternoon, and they go on the picnic at the farm, and a lot of great visuals there of them going through. Yeah, that's you quite. Know, the, and the little kid, the little kid jumping out of, out of the wheat field. Yeah, that was like funny. a shark or something. We got fish in a sea of wheat. Yeah, great, great scenes, um, great, great visuals. But then him, he climbs the tree, and just yells, "I want a woman! I want a woman!" All afternoon into the evening, no one can get him out. He throws rocks at everybody who tries. And shouting, I want a woman! I want a woman! Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's actually a pretty enjoyable scene, I think. And Yeah, no, it's... And it's and weird because being, being the only person saying it outright in a... Yeah. He's a crazy man, but he's probably the least childish of them all. Exactly. In his weird exactly. way, he makes a bold, straight-out statement about what he wants. He doesn't go through yeah. any infantile he, games or any, like, playing around. He climbs a yeah. tree and says, you get me a woman, and I'm going to stay up here until I get it. It's kind of... Everybody in this Everybody in this movie is just horny. He is the most honest about right, it. Right, exactly. And he's the only one who's not playing games, basically. is the insane yeah. man. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Our, our child. Well, and then... The, it's the least child. Like yeah, and then the way he comes down, like when they get down, the, the I guess the whoever the the doctor who runs the asylum, the way he treats it is just I love it because totally just like oh these things happen. These things he happen. even addresses yes, exactly. the, the 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 care everybody. It's like yeah, you know, we all feel this way. We all have whatever. days like this. I'm like what? we all have days like this. Everyone in the city every day is like this. Right. We all have days like Just this. Minus the, th- the rock throwing. Yes, minus the rock throwing. And minus the only way to entice him down being uh, the... Uh, the female nun. The dwarf nun. Yeah. The dwarf nun. So weird. <laughs> oh, great. No, no. There's a lot of really great funny moments in this movie. A lot of, a lot of really great... Uh, you know, you know what this movie really reminds me what? of? An episode of Family Guy. It is a little bit. It's Yeah, it's kind of... I was going to say that, for me, personally, this reminds me if somehow Tim Burton directed Mel Brooks's... Uh, I, uh, what is it? Uh, what is it? What is the name of the movie? The History movie. Which one are you... Oh, I forget the name. Oh, History of the yeah, World. Yeah, History of the World Part 1. Like, if, if you combine somehow a Tim Burton yeah. sort of film like a uh, cinematography style with yeah Mel Brooks's because it's just again just it's, tableaus of what of yeah. some event that is significant to the creator yeah mm, no yeah. certainly no that's a great but I that think that's the same sort of thing you get with Family Guy too though right it's like these are here are some jokes that we thought of yeah and they're all significant to us but there's not a major connection between each one yeah uh, most uh, a lot of the jokes in Family Guy have nothing to do with the plot. There is actually a plot in Family Guy on occasion, <laughs> um, usually, 
Um, but but the principal jokes, the really funny, outrageous things, are the cutaway scenes. Right, and, and this film like, is the same thing. Yeah. And this film is all cutaway. Really. Right, yeah, without a central no plot. plot, yeah. I mean, well, I mean yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it is scenes. It's like he just wanted to create a film that is scenes of fascism. Yes. 1932 to 1933. Or whatever. Hooray! Yeah, I, I, yeah but, like, I mean, it, I mean, overall, each one of them individually is fairly enjoyable. I was, I enjoyed oh, yeah. the film that oh, way. Yeah. It was just, it could have used a plot. <laughs> But then again, I guess maybe the idea was that any sort of plot would have erased the main message about the absurdity of fascism in Italy. Yeah. Oh, no. If they had put in a plot, I mean, like we that love story we, or whatever it had been would have been would have overwhelmed the absurdity. Because yes, the absurdity absolutely. is so... Yeah, if there's a plot, the absurdity is not going to seem as important. So maybe that was... Or as absurd. Reason. Yeah, he was like, <laughs> well, if I put a plot in here, everybody's going to miss the main point. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. You're you're absolutely right. Um Let's see what else. What else we got? Not much. <laughs> uh there's a there is a peacock. Yes, yeah. No, no. The peacock makes it interesting cuz all of the young men and everyone in the city really, but but specifically the young men um are obsessed in these like peripherals of sex. Like they have their they have their one meeting. Uh, everybody's talking, standing in the rain, staring at the butt of that <laughs> female <laughs> statue. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we get the we get the peacock, and obviously uh, there's a lot of peacocking going on in this movie. Everybody's yeah. positioning themselves to be this this sexual thing. Um, and it's really weird to me too. I just really really clicked here, Volpina. For all of her sexual posturing, we never actually see her do anything or with or, a man. Yeah, she she's never just running around in either. the background flirting with people, but she doesn't do anything. Yeah, in fact, and all the, the other characters who are supposed to be, like, for instance, what's her name? Uh, Gr- uh, yeah, for all of her sort of supposedly, like, demure, demure sort of attitude is the one who <laughs> closest comes to just sleeping around like crazy. Yes. And, but you get that, yeah, Volpino, which, who is supposed to be the crazy sexual maniac who basically never gets anywhere near a man. So he's always like yeah. across the street yelling at them. Exactly, exactly. And the closest she ever gets to anyone on screen is when she walks into the uh, the construction site and Tita's dad just sent her away. Yeah, yeah. It's like, so, I, you know, at the same time, you start to wonder is this also kind of a commentary on like sort of the misapplication of uh, generalizations about people maybe maybe but who knows and it definitely gets in there but who can remember the details right. that's uh Tia's mom says that um in the when she's talking about when they were young when they were young trying to comfort him or whatnot you know like she can't remember something and she just says well who can remember the details right. and that's that's really where yeah, we are in this whole movie, movie. Yeah, um, it's a it's a it's a theme line. Ah, <laughs> uh, and then we have the ridiculous. We get to winter, and there's the new ridiculous amount I of snow because that. there always is. I were there Everybody's the got tunnels. that one snowstorm when they were a kid. Yeah, that's huge. Whereas, oh, it must have been like eight feet. Yeah, and yeah, it really plays into that because like there's the snow so high that like they've made ice tunnels. Like I don't yes. think that happened. <laughs> Probably not. And then the dad why not? Let's do it for a week. It's like, no, it hasn't. <laughs> There's like seven feet. It's taller than anyone. Yeah, yeah. You can't even see over the embankments of snow. It's like, ah, come on. Yeah. But they somehow managed to carve out paths through it. I don't yes. think you get the... With, with shovels can... Yeah, who knows. Oh, I, I, I've come close. Well, I mean, but... When I, was, when I was nine, and, and I know I just said everybody's got that one snowstorm... Um, but when I was nine, living in Maryland, we did actually, two years running, have blizzards described as storms of the century. Um, we had four feet of snow one year, and then five feet the next right, year. Right, but you had machines. And all, yeah, all we did, in order to get out of our house, uh, we opened the garage door and just started digging. Well, yeah, but that's another thing entirely, is you had a, like, a reason to dig. Think about it. This yeah. is a town without cars. 
the only car we really you yeah. see like one actual automobile I think in the whole film or yeah. two well there's the guy there's the motorcycle, motorcycle guy too. and he also drives a car crazy through the streets at one point but basically yes. none of the townspeople have cars so there's no reason for them to dig this tunnel network they could just dig the passage yeah. out of their house and then walk on top of the snow awesome because but if you did that you wouldn't get the effect of seeing that it's eight feet tall so yes. that's purely a visual effect to point out how insanely tall the snow is. Yes. How how exaggerated is it? Because there's no tall. reason why you would waste so much energy on doing that. Yeah. No, and, and yeah. No, I'm just saying. And it's it's part of the whole it's part of the whole Right. He needs to point out that the snow yeah. is eight frickin' feet yeah. tall. Because it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, everything is you know, it's ridiculous that every every single person in the town goes out to sea at midnight to watch this oh, boat. Oh, I know. That's by. great, though. Like, even the blind guy with the accordion goes out. It's like, yes, who invited yes. him? Who offered him Why passage on the boat? Why does he need to be there? He can't, yeah, he see, can't the see the boat. He's just there to serenade the boat. Yes. But it's 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 for Italy. Well, and then there's a sort of, I Close think it's got to be a commentary. The fact that the, the they go out there for Italy, and then that boat basically nearly kills them all. Yes! Yes. The, boat, the boat doesn't care. Right, right. Like, they're out there to support, basically, representing support fascist Italy. Even the ones who don't want to be there are there to support Italy. Yeah. And then Italy basically nearly kills them. Yep. That's got to be commentary. Well, welcome to fascism. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I really, in a lot of ways, that that's his entire commentary on the state of fascist Italy is like, look, we did all these things for you, and then you basically nearly killed us all. Yes. It's yeah, great, no. though. You know? And and they did it because they felt like it should be done, or, you know, everybody's just kind of in it for themselves. Yeah, yeah, there's <laughs> no... I mean, there's a lot of talk of Italy and Mussolini, but yeah. then everybody has these reasons why they're involved that are absurd. Like, Gradiska yeah. is involved to hunt for her man, and, you know, all the yeah. boys are involved because it's, I guess they believe that they'll get chicks this way. Yeah. Well, it's all it's all very much, uh, you know, it's all very selfish, yeah. but it's all very, very obsessed with this idea of, of Well, sex yeah, and, and the, the power of the fascist regime is directly connected to the power of sex for these people. Yes. I guess that's what Italy's like. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think that basically think we covers have, the uh, entire movie. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, we've run out of beautiful run out of ways to say. Yeah, the same thing. What beautiful? I, the only other scene yeah. I guess I remember is the one about the race cars and then Gradiska getting into the race car or whatever. That was an interesting scene, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Uh, everybody's yeah. You know, everybody's driving their car and getting. Getting their woman yeah, it's in, their, really... in their little, their little Italian race well, it's cars. Like, wow, all is very this part phallic. of the race? <laughs> like, is this like because it's so yeah happening? It's like, well, maybe this is some. And the race is at night, right. so yeah, what? it's like what? Yeah, yeah. The, no, great visuals there. Great visual. Uh, and another visually awesome scene, and we kind of mentioned earlier the toothless guy talking about his adventures with the sheik's harem. That's, yeah, that's a fun. Uh, scene. When he breaks into their room. When he's when he's walking into the hotel and all of the ladies are throwing out their their yeah uh, like their 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 sheet their bed sheet their ropes, sheet ropes yeah. yeah and inviting him up and then he climbs up into one of the rooms and there's like twenty of them in this room it's alone all like of totally the, decked out in this like yeah all totally decked out and immediately breaking yeah into that's number. wonderful oh uh, it's a and wonderful if there's any movie. scene that points out that this is the flawed memories of people. It's that. Yes, it there's a dance it's number. There's no such thing as dance numbers in real life, but there's <laughs> no a dance number. Dance. No one does dance numbers in real life. No, I mean, not not spontaneously. And so, no one I'm just, yeah, it's like, that's such a, like, an obvious point where they're pointing out, look, none of this actually happened. Yeah. This is all yeah. people's yeah. broken that's memories of the past. Yeah. Comedic yeah. broken memories. No, it's really yeah. Good. Is that really everything? Yeah, I guess. 
I, 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 I've got nothing really no, else to we, say. Oh, <laughs> I've got one. I have a note here that says, ah, uh, ass crack. <laughs> don't remember the scene exactly, but obviously it was enough for me to write it down. <laughs> I don't, there I don't, is a, definitely a scene with major amount of ass crack. Um, we oh, see somebody I know what takes... it is. It's the bath after the castor oil thing. Yes, the bath. The father after the is oil. taking a bath, is. and they just man, they could have cut like half a second earlier, <laughs> maybe about two seconds. Oh, and then well, he I chases mean, it's, his it's son another... out of the room. Oh, yeah. it's... it's another invent... infantile oh, thing because his wife's giving. Oh, him I the know. Bath in a tu- in, it like in a heated water cauldron. Yeah, yeah. It's just, but like, ugh. I was like, oh man, guys. After the masturbation yeah. scene, you're gonna, scene, you're gonna throw me this too. <laughs> Wait, is it cool to make this the least Aww. appealing movie ever? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the movie was not sexually appealing. Well, to and you. then after uh, the what Seven Samurai, where we basically spent an entire two hours staring at ass cracks, I'm starting to wonder about classical film. <laughs> well, there's a lot of butts in classical Apparently. film. Apparently, that's okay. No. <laughs> at least this movie wasn't all about this. <laughs> right? I hope that's <laughs> I mean, not on the list. Well, in general, it, it kind of could have been, but it's about the rest of the body just yeah. as much as it was about There's not a particular stuff. focus on that particular area. <laughs> yes. No particular focus on butts. <laughs> okay, so I guess we... <laughs> so uh, next we're talking about the 400 Blows, so uh, we'll see you then. Listeners who are still we listening. Probably are not still uh, listening. It should be fun. Oh, yeah, I think it'll be uh, that's, uh, that's a French... French film, we jump from Italy to France, for Truffaut's, Truffaut's, Truffaut, I don't know how to say his name, it's French, Um, movie that kicked off the French New Wave, so we'll get there, and we'll talk about that, and we'll see you then. Talk to you later. I guess we won't see you, this is a a podcast, we'll just talk to you, Um, and you're not really going to talk back, it's not a conversation. Yeah, we'll talk at you, to each other, and you'll listen, and hopefully enjoy it. And now we're rambling. Time to quit. Bye. Bye.